Well, I think we are uh, beyond time, so we will go ahead and initiate. This is the panel discussion on 3D wave propagation. So welcome, everybody. Thank you to those who are attending online as well as in person. Um, I'm very honored to have been requested to moderate this panel. And uh, I was just told that uh, there was a seismologist that was supposed to be on the panel who was unable to make it. I am a seismologist, but I'm not prepared to actually offer prepared remarks. <laughs> so I will, um, I will pass it along to our hydroacoustics and infrasound specialists who are going to be talking about their disciplines. Uh, my name is Charlotte Rowe. I am with Los Alamos National Laboratory in the United States. And I will be playing MC for this very engaging panel discussion. So I'd like to start out by introducing our panel members. Um, immediately to my left is Dr. Kevin Haney. He received his bachelor's degree in physics from UC Santa Barbara, master's in physics from the University of Maryland, and his PhD in applied ocean sciences from Scripps Institute of Oceanography. After holding positions at SAIC and OASIS, he established applied ocean sciences in 2019, where he serves as president and CEO. Kevin has extensive experience in ocean acoustic propagation and modeling, geoacoustic inversion, adaptive sonar signal processing, and data analysis. His work includes long-range acoustic tomography, rapid environmental characterization, and effects of internal waves on signal coherence. Immediately to Dr. Haney's left is Dr. Roger Waxler. He was trained as a theoretical physicist through bachelor's in mathematics from the University of Chicago and a PhD in physics from Columbia University. He drifted into acoustics 25 years ago and has specialized in acoustics of the Earth's atmosphere for most of those 25 years. His appointments have included time spent at the Institute for Theoretical Physics at Etaha in Zurich, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, SUNY Buffalo, and Penn State. He's, he landed at the University of Mississippi, where he is currently a principal scientist with expertise in long-range infrasound propagation and source modeling. Roger also involves himself in data analysis, signal processing, and he's led the design and execution of numerous experimental field campaigns. Professor Sylvia Blanc, who is at the far left up here, um, her academic training in physics was acquired at the Universidad de Buenos Aires and the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. She was involved in R&D for hydroacoustics since 1974 at the Universidad de Buenos Aires, the Argentinian Navy, and the Defense Strategic and Development Unit of the National Council of Scientific and Technical Research. She has served as a visiting researcher at the ICTP, the Institute of Ocean Sciences in the UK, the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory in Florida, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and the United States Naval Research Laboratory. Um, Sylvia's field of particular interest is modeling underwater sound wave propagation, scattering by volume elements, uh, bottom interaction, and uh, the acoustic scattering. So we have some people with very frightening resumes here who are going to offer some prepared remarks and observations for five minutes each uh, regarding their particular field of expertise. Uh, and then we're going to open it up for questions, either among the panelists, um, some questions that have come to me as a seismologist who knows enough about these topics just to be dangerous. And of course, we welcome audience and online questions as well. And don't be shy to ask a question, because if you're wondering something, you may be sure that half of the room has the same question, and they'll be grateful to you that you were brave enough to ask it. So I will begin with Kevin, um, Dr. Haney, and please. All right, well, thank you, Charlotte. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is kind of an intimidating room. I'm, we can mostly <laughs> see bright lights and, and faces in the back. Um, I also want to point out, um, uh, um, that this is a fantastic screensaver on the, on the right of the screen, which I spent about an hour and a half yesterday watching spin around um, with the global, the global propagation. The issue there that I had with it, though, is that every single ray that you see traced there is, is, is following a geodesic, which is a straight line on, on, on the globe. 
And so that's an entirely two-dimensional propagation model that they've used, um, which the gamers have, have monetized and have successfully done ray tracing for, for, for video game technology. When you get to sound wave propagation, however, it satisfies the wave equation, which means that it, it, it refracts as the index of refraction changes, and it defracts and bends around edges. And so, um, and so most of our modeling and almost all of our computational approaches to date have, have ignored that fact and said, let's solve the problem in, along a geodesic. And so, um, so when, when you start to, to go to low frequencies and you include bathymetric interactions for hydroacoustics, all of a sudden there's ridges and edges and shelves and, and changes of the environment everywhere. And so 3D acoustics can, 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 can be a, an issue. Um, I can't, I'm going to go back a little bit through some, some, some of my history, um, and I can't be in, in Vienna and talk about long range acoustics without referring to um, Walter Monk, who was the best oceanographer of probably three generations. If he had lived two more, he would have taken them over as well. Um, but he brought me into ocean acoustics with a, a, an experiment um, off of Hurt Island, where they sent sound at low frequency, and they picked up that sound in Bermuda, off the east coast of the US, in California, off the west coast of the US. Um, and, and through Australia, the Indian Ocean, and, um, and Australia, um, I think I already said Australia. And um, anyway, so they had like nine stations, and it turned out to be very, very close to where the Crozet station is on the CTBTO <coughs> network, knowing that if you put a receiver there, you can hear sound from the ocean from any part of, of from, from lots and lots and lots of places. Um, so I had the privilege of, of coming into graduate school in the early 90s um, when these long-range propagations was, was demonstrated. And it was, it was right around the standing up of the IMS network and CTBTO. And so it's been a pleasure to been, have come here for many, many years to talk about you know, 19,000 kilometer propagation distances. Um, and so I'd also like to, 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 to do a shout out, for lack of a better word, to um, Mark Pryor and Laszlo Eslo. Evers, I'm sorry, Mark Pryor and Laszlo Evers, who were, were friends and colleagues of mine, and they sat on a trove of IMS data, and every time they found something that was curious or they couldn't explain it, they would call me up, and, and six months later we would write a paper because sound had gone around some edge, and they found it where they didn't expect to. Um, so right now we're in the process of putting together acoustics codes to say how can we utilize um, three, how can we include 3D acoustics propagation in the IMS automated system. And it, it's important, there's a small percentage of the ocean that, that is, is um, that has 3D propagation that would affect localization and detection. But it gets important when the automated algorithm has to, has to associate an event from say Crozet and then from Diego Garcia um, the automated algorithm, if, 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 it, if it can say, hey, I got that, and he, um, I, I have this receiver, or I have this event, and these two are from the same signal, then, then the localization algorithm can move forward. Um, if, if, if the event is in a blockage position, then the event, the automated detection says, nope, can't use that one. And then all of a sudden, the analyst has to go back in, and they have to dig it up, and they have to reconstruct it. So there's opportunities there to use the 3D propagation to, to help the system. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Roger. Thank you. Uh, I'm also strangely intimidated by this room, and I'll <laughs> try to ignore that. Uh, there are two parts of the atmosphere that force you to consider out-of-plane propagation. Uh, there might be more, but there are two that are at least obvious to us right now. One has been obvious for a while. If your signal encounters crosswinds during its path, it gets moved, and when it hits an array, the back azimuth the array determines is then pointing in the wrong direction, and that has to be corrected for. And that is usually good enough to use geometric acoustics for that, but that's, that's been an effect that we needed to correct for some time because the localizations in infrasound are done using back azimuths. Uh, the other effect is one that we're beginning to include right now. When, when you start getting uh, orography, the mountains and so on, into the propagation, you do not get it correct if you only include two-dimensional propagation. Uh, you're ignoring the things that scatter out of the plane, and you're also treating a, a mountain peak as if it were a full extended object, and so you're overestimating the shadow. So those are at least two spots where you cannot avoid uh, taking into account out-of-plane propagation. One of the features of 
uh, acoustic propagation in the atmosphere is that the atmosphere is a changeable beast. There is temporal variability that is, a, a, is constant. <laughs> and, you know, the, it, the seismologists have caught up with us, but 10, 15 years ago, there'd always be a seismologist in the audience who unwittingly was being a straight man, would say, how accurately do I need to know the atmosphere to accurately model that propagation? And the answer is wrong question. <laughs> because if you knew the atmosphere to arbitrary uh, uh, accuracy right now, it would never be that again. So in order to study acoustic propagation in the atmosphere, you need to do a lot of runs. It's, it's automatically a statistical problem. You know, there's a, a, an exception. If you have one event that occurred and you want to study that event and you have months and months to study it, well, then there was an atmosphere at that time. And to the extent to which you can know that atmosphere, you can use that. But if you want to do uh, planning, network design, and, and, and basic understanding of what's expected to happen, it is a, a statistical problem as knowing the atmosphere is. And so you, we need codes that are quick so that we can run them through 100 atmospheres without, you know, without waiting a lifetime or two. So that means that while finite difference time domain codes can in principle solve the full problem, they have limited application because they're good for knowing what happens, giving you an idea of what's going on for a single atmosphere, but you're not going to run 100 atmospheres through such a code. So it's important in atmospheric propagation to have codes that are efficient, but that also capture the correct physics with the least amount of complications. And so that's just a feature of the subject. Uh, we don't have the situation that they have in ocean acoustics where you'll propagate around an island. It's rare that there is an infrasound station on the backside of a mountain that you have to worry about. It, it might be someday. <coughs> but uh, that's the situation where it stands. We're a little behind in propagation modeling capability compared to uh, ocean acoustics and seismology. And I, I think that's because there was a, felt a stronger, greater need for those two subjects in the past than there has been for infrasound. And so, you know, we're catching up. Uh, getting the propagation models right is math and computer science. The big problem for us is the atmosphere. And we're customers, in a sense, of the atmospheric scientists who have been making great strides in the past decade or more. And so there's that interplay between, between them and us. There's a bit of a disconnect between what they need and what we need, but that's, I think we're all familiar with that. That's the way it is. Uh, but we're just beginning to get to the point where we can start including the uncertainties from the atmosphere into our uncertainties in our propagation analysis. And, and I guess that's my introduction. Thank you. And um, Professor Blanc, Sylvia, you have some comments? Yes. Well, when I was kindly invited to participate in this panel, um, something that I have read some years ago uh, came to my mind. It was in the preface of a book written by Paul Etter, where they say that the subject of under acoust underwater acoustics modeling deals with the translation of our physical understanding of the sound in the ocean into mathematical formulae that can be solved by computers. I think that most of the people in this room will agree that this short and clever sentence uh, mm, implies a great complexity that is involved in that short sentence. On one side, I should say that everybody has spoken yesterday and even today about the great capabilities of the CTBT IMS hydroacoustic network system. There is no doubt for anybody that uh, it's very valuable, not only for nuclear detections, but even to detect other types of acoustic signals. There were many examples in previous uh, conferences of this type, where it was, there were examples of uses for waves vocalization, for detecting signals coming from air guns surveys, from, uh, uh, 
how we're going to say, a volcanic submarine activity, or even anomalies associated to the unfortunate loss of the Ara San Juan submarine uh, belonging to my country and or to the vessel El Faro. So there is no doubt about the capabilities of the system. What happens if we think on the analysis of these registered signals? Now a great complexity comes because everybody knows that there is an important coupling between the emitted uh, waves, the emitted acoustic waves, the medium itself and its boundaries, and all the interactions that take place in all these three components. Well, uh, even in, I think, 1996, it was Tolstoy who mentioned the importance of 3D propagation model in order to have a very comprehensive idea of the behavior of the acoustic waves in the ocean, and consequently, to get a good look and accurate localization and characterization of the sources that produce the signals then registered by the systems. In that sense, I may say that currently, high computing, high performance computing contributes a lot, in my opinion, to help and uh, to, be, why? Because uh, it facilitates the use of uh, assimilation data systems that are very useful to take into account a great amount of input data to the acoustic models. And they are available, most of them, in the web. We all know the Copernicus system, uh, which, for example, gives us a good estimation of the sound of uh, velocity uh, field, and especially useful when you have very scarce data, experimental data, or the shape code for bathymetry. Well, that helps on one side. Uh, then for I should like to mention that for small scale, a relatively small scale, there have been developed some models based on finite element methods or uh, boundary element methods that are very rigorous, that uh, have good formula theoretical formulations that did, do not necessarily use any artificial condition for the boundaries but uh, they are suitable only for a relatively small scale. For example, at 20 hertz, I think, you will have only a suitable predictions for a few hundreds of kilometers. So uh, on the other side, we have the methods based particularly on the parabolic equation in the different versions split step Pade or Fourier, and they are basically the methods that are used in two dimensions and in three dimensions. Of course, when we try to make, as Dr. Kinney mentioned, 3D models in order to take into account diffraction, refraction, and so many other physical phenomena occurring in the sea, necessarily uh, we need more computing time, more uh, different media to, to be able to, to make the calculations. But nowadays, we have with the high uh, performance computing, uh, as I have said, a good tool to improve things and uh, to develop different codes that can be run in GPU or CPU. So, as a summary, I may say that with all these nice and beautiful current tools, and with the great amount of data, of acoustic data registered by the IMS system, uh, all the acoustics, uh, acousticians uh, that work in the ocean, well, we have a great challenge because there are good tools to make uh, to 
make some new steps, but it's not easy, of course. Uh, however, I think that the, the present, the, the current tools will help in two senses. In one sense, it will help to validate transmission losses models. On the other side, they could help us to study in depth the inverse problem, that is, to infer uh, properties of the sources that gave origin, that generate the signals that are registered in the systems. That's what more or less I want to say, and it's a challenge for all of us, and well, we hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that kind of brings a couple of questions, and granted, you have to understand these questions are coming from the brain of a seismologist. <laughs> um, so these questions actually could apply both to hydroacoustic and to, to atmospheric infrasound. Um, we'll start with Roger, and I'm going to combine a couple of ideas. Um, first of all, the largest source of uncertainty in atmospheric infrasound, you know, what is that source of uncertainty? We always worry about uncertainty in our seismic models, um, but related to that, in our global seismic models, we rely a lot on ground truth data. And so from that perspective, what constitutes a ground truth experiment or source in atmospheric infrasound, given that the model keeps changing and so whatever you come up with for the ground truth propagation at one instant may not apply a few hours later. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I never thought of it that way, because <laughs> when we talk about ground truth, we talk about being able to characterize the source. Oh, okay. Okay, and uh, uh, just in, within the past two decades, people have started putting sensors close to the source, don't trust uh, the person doing the explosion, telling you how much weight is in there. That's, you need to know what actually blew up. Uh, sometimes there's directivity, and so instrumenting the near field mm -hmm. is something that uh, people have, have, I hope, accepted as a necessity. Mm -hmm. And that's what ground truth means in that okay. context. <laughs> uh, I, I am not optimistic, but I would love to be able to predict that at some point, uh, during my lifetime, we would have a ground truth atmospheric model, mm -hmm. but I, I would be very surprised. Uh, so the, the use of the experiments has been, we know about the source completely, mm -hmm. and the atmosphere is, is uh, the, the beast, the unknown that, that we're studying, looking at the received signals at great distances from the source. Okay. okay. And how about hydroacoustics? <laughs> Anybody? I would say that um, we have a better job of understanding the sources because we usually put them out ourselves. Um, and so there was, a, there was a lot of effort going into explosive sources um, in the 70s and 80s because the Navy would drop thousands of them as part of their sonar system. Um, and then they were used in the scientific community for a while. Um, and those, those we have a pretty good understanding of the, of the source levels of where it went off and, and when. And then we moved on to electronic sources, which are fixed, and we, we put in transmitted signals. And um, so for us, I think the, the ground truth, that, I mean, the, our, our beast, to use um, Roger's language, would, would be the ocean that, that is variable between the, sources and the source and the receiver. Um, and this, um, you know, we're, we're also customers of the hydrodynamic models, the global hydrodynamic models, um, which have actually, an, you know, which I think of as our data poor. But from the infrasound perspective, there's so much more data going into them um, that constrained and their data assimilative. Um, and so we, we, we fairly often have a good representation of the ocean um, from a forecast model, and we know the sources. And then I think the next level of uncertainty comes into the, what, what's going on with the sediment. Um, for shallow water and local experiments, we can, we can, we can understand the sediment because you can measure it um, or you can invert for it. But when you get out into the open ocean with 10,000 kilometer paths, you know, what is the seafloor um, within the 50 kilometers near a volcano, right? Well, somewhere there's basalt, somewhere there's mud, somewhere there's silt, somewhere there's sand because it's a beach of Hawaii. And so where, where do those things match? And, and so then the question is how much, does that in, inter, how much does that change your acoustic propagation path? Um, and for the global stuff, we're not, we're not really sure that, it, that that's a big impact. 
I would assume that the sediments and the seafloor interactions, as well as in the Arctic and Antarctic, the uh, underside of the ice interactions, are going to be very frequency dependent. Yes, they are. And they're changing. And they're changing, yes. <laughs> uh, we, when I say we, I mean not us, but we've worked with the people who do the explosions. Uh, but still, when you buy a chunk of explosive and put it out, you don't really know what you're going to get. And so it's, it, 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 you do near field measurements. And for surface explosions, uh, uh, the overpressure, which I think of as acoustics, but they call it overpressure, uh, is really the gold standard for how you determine the yield. Yeah. So that's, that's important to actually know what the explosion did. Um, Sylvia, do you think you could talk a little bit more about the handshake between the parabolic equations and where they meet up with the finite element part of Sorry? the modeling? The handshake, the coupling between, um, the, the, yeah, how to join up the, the parabolic equation propagation yes. with the finite element portions. Uh, Something that worries me is that, uh, for example, e I think that we need validated models in order to uh, understand completely the bottom interaction of elastic waves mm -hmm. in one way. Another point which worries me is that uh, we all know that we have a reasonable information about bathymetric features in a global scale, but uh, I think we don't have the same type of information about the sediment properties, neither the structure or the stratification of the sediments. And there are occasions in which uh, these, the, these situations uh, are a condition, are a boundary to the problem in, in reality. And I also agree with you that uh, we, have the challenge of including in our models the dynamic interface uh, between atmosphere and the water column. Because we have seen in particular problems uh, that that dynamic interface, a dynamic boundary, can bring many different values not predicted in the usual models. For example, at high latitudes, the Antarctic or the Arctic, we have the ice sheet which really brings us such a problem. <laughs> That's what we know that it is a problem. We know that it has to be taken into account. I don't know how, really. I'd like to, yeah. I'd like to fo follow up on that. I, I think Sylvia brought up a great point, which is what do we do about shear? Um, and so in the, in the ocean acoustics community, we just ignore it. We, um, we treat the bottom as a fluid, fluid layer and move on from there and hope that you don't have an, a system precise enough to measure um, our, our errors or our ignorance. Um, that's, that's primarily because of computational speed and efficiency. We do have ways of putting it in. There, there is a shear PE, a, a par parabolic equation that includes shear, um, but I think only Michael Collins can run it because he wrote it, and, um, and so it's, it's not used. Um, <coughs> Um, regularly in the community. I will, I will actually go, go back and answer the question of finite element to, to the PE. Um, when we're looking at global propagation where you have to predict travel time or back azimuth or intensity level, it's very difficult to find one model that will give you all of those answers. And so we use a, 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 a bunch of different models and we use normal modes, we use the PE, we use ray tracing, um, all of which give sort of different clues to what's going on. Um, but in the context of moving from one model to the next, and this is relevant to the T phase problem, where you have a, a hydroacoustic wave and then it goes ashore and it, it hits one of the T phase stations, there's coupling there between the um, pressure wave in the ocean and then the, the, the shear wave in the, in the island, basically. And so we, we do need to do that coupling from one model to the next at that point. And so um, numerically the way that that's done is we take the pressure field in the vertical on the computational grid and then you can map that either into the PE or you can use that as a starter field in the PE. So if you wanted to go from a T phase station or an earthquake into the ocean, you could run a finite element model there or an, a model that includes shear. Once it gets into the ocean, then it's a, a, a pressure wave only and you can start the PE and march it across the ocean with the PE. So there's lots of ways you can use multiple models um, to study things that are really complicated. Can I ask a question to the ocean people? Mm -hmm. Uh, is it true for 
the applications the CTBTO is considering, that the, the sediment and the, the interaction with the shear is really only important for the T wave, for the T phase? For the deep ocean, that, do you stay in the duct and keep off the ground? Yes. I, I think that it depends on the frequency, no? I think it depends on the frequency range. And there are uh, frequency ranges, low ones, that they, those effects are important. So, uh, well, I, I have some experience, but in shallow waters, uh, that's different. But uh, if you have us in our country, shallow waters, but a very long, uh, uh, how you say, continental shelf, mm -hmm. uh, you will see that uh, models who, which seems to work okay, they just collapses when you find different types of sediments. And if you want to give a good prediction, you really can't use a model that has, has been uh, formulated with an hypothesis, for example, of sand, if you have a completely different uh, type of sediment. Going back to, uh, from Roger's question, we, uh, I mean, we're computational physicists working today, so we're, we're looking for the hardest, most complicated problems that we can solve. <laughs> and the answer is that the IMS system lives on mode one that was excited as mode one. It traveled all the way across the ocean and it hit the receiver in the sound channel axis as mode one. And so at that point, it didn't hit the ice, it didn't hit the seafloor, there was no shear. And so I would say that the system survives on, on adiabatic mode propagation and axial propagation um, quite quite well, um, you know. The pl there's and then, but there's plenty of places where that's not true. The one place that shear I think matters in an observable context on the IMS is the Crozet reception of the San Juan um, uh, implosion, um, which which basically propagated from the disaster site off Argentina into the ice sheet off of Antarctica and zipped along on the ice sheet of Antarctica, went back into the ocean and was received on Crozet. And so that's a shear wave, which we don't really, I don't want to say we don't know how to model. It's not, it's not easily done by any of the models that we use. But people in, in, in the IMS talk about the T-phase. Yeah. So that raises the question of how does the sound go from the, from the earth into the water column? And that's a, that's a hard problem. And one of the things I know is that as earthquakes go on, and I think Tiago has a fantastic paper, recent paper on this, um, where the earthquake happens and it's usually, um, it, it's well below the surface, the surface shakes, but then um, um, seismic waves will go to any region where there's an extended island into the water column and it'll trans translate into the, propagate into the water column from there. So you get a very distributed source mechanism where you can have islands and I, I've seen tracking of earthquakes that really, the earthquake is over to the right but there's an island in the middle and, and then with an array they can see that the sound can be coming from the island itself. We see something similar in the atmosphere where an earthquake can send a surface wave and shake a mountain and then the mountain radiates, or not just a mountain, I'm looking at the people who wrote the paper, <laughs> there can be a, a basin or whatever it was that radiates, uh, but some structure of the earth that can, yes. can turn into a radiator for nice, right. infrasound. Uh, I don't know how critical that is for the IMS, but it is a phenomenon that's been observed. It seems to me like, the, um, just interesting scientifically, that you would see some sort of resonance effects from something like that, where you were exciting a basin or the ice sheet where you would actually get a dominant frequency as a result of what's most efficiently propagating through resonance through the material? Has that been observed? I don't think so. I don't know. That's okay. a good question. So I guess you're asking about why the structure in the earth is shaking enough. Uh, I'm thinking of the basin, for instance, because know. it's going to have vessel function modes. I'm of, looking at the know, people who know, but I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody in the ask. audience have any opinion on that? There's a microphone here that you could come down and speak into if yeah, you want. Yeah. I'm thinking of the yeah. yellow and the yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I saw yeah, yeah. Well, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, we'd really like to entertain your thoughts and kind of get a freewheeling conversation going. Come on down. There's a microphone in the aisle there. Thanks, uh, thanks for all the members of this uh, panel discussion. Me, Abdel Halim Zawi from uh, High National School of Technology. I have a question about uh, these uh, new techniques uh, which we hear in the media, quantum computer. It's <laughs> easy to, to, to turn this uh, code to 
because uh, the specialists say that uh, uh, not all kind of code can be executed by this uh, uh, quantum computer. Uh, if uh, the wave propagation in three dimension can be easily uh, make uh, or executed by this uh, new kind of computer. Can, can I answer with a question? <laughs> can I ask you if you've ever seen a quantum computer outside of the newspaper? Uh, what? Have you ever seen a quantum computer outside of a newspaper? No. <laughs> so. <laughs> we, we've looked into that um, and talked to some people we know who run a, a, a real quantum computer place. Um, and and the, the real challenge is how do you take um, the wave equation and turn it into six bits of logic that can fit into the, into the code itself. And so, so we've come up with ideas how you could maybe do tomography or things like that, but I think the wave equation itself is a ways away from, from being able to um, encode into a quantum system. So are there quantum computers in existence that can really calculate? Yeah, there are. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, really simple things, really fast. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'll go ahead with some additional questions of my own while we're waiting for audience members to come down with smarter ones. <laughs> um, so here's a question um, for Kevin, maybe for Sylvia, maybe for Roger. Um, what are the environmental input needs and deficiencies um, for computing the 3D effects that we need to account for? You asked what are the environmental inputs and... The, the environmental uh, input needs, what's needed, and what are the deficiencies in the way that we are computing 3D effects right now? Uh, the, we, yeah, we, well, no, we need, we need a, a vertical profile of temperature and wind velocity, uh, and it, 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 it probably is not good enough to have it at one spot. We need it as it changes sort of adiabatically as you move along your propagation path. And that's difficult to obtain. Uh, currently, we use what the atmospheric scientists call models. And they're to the data driven to the extent that data is available. But there, there are gaps in the atmosphere that it's, it's hard to get data from. Uh, I should say that those gaps are, are steadily decreasing. So the altitude at which one can get what's considered reliable data has been constantly increasing during the past decade or more. But we still have, have uh, sparse data in the sense that there are several hours between uh, the reports that we get about what the atmospheric state is, and there's it's a spatial and temporal uh, interpolation. Uh, it doesn't capture fine structure that we know is relevant. The, the bottom line is, when an acoustic signal travels, it experiences the atmosphere that's there at the particular moment that it travels through it. And the same is true of the ocean. Uh, an atmospheric scientist cannot give you that. I said, you never say cannot. But in order for something to make sense scientifically, you have to get an average. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you, you can get, and that washes out the fine structure which we know influences the propagation. So uh, there's a lot of work that's been going on the past decade or more in trying to learn how to, how to deal with that. Uh, at, at, at you, you, everyone believes that it has to be a statistical problem. I have heard people say, well, no, at some point we'll give you the accurate atmosphere. I'm still waiting. Uh, so we're, we're just beginning to get to terms with that. Now, if a statistical problem, what would that tell you? That'll tell you what to expect. Mm -hmm. If you have an event you want to study, again, it's, that's not a statistical problem. The atmosphere was what it was, and one of the approaches that people in the community take is to try to use the acoustic signal to improve the atmospheric specification. That's been an ongoing effort for some time, uh, and it's it, actually it, it's difficult, but it, it makes it fun. Well, we have an online question that people are going to actually think I paid them to ask right at this moment because it's a nice follow-on, kind of turning this issue on its head. And I think the hydroacoustic question might be the one that is actually thinking in these terms. Um, and this question is, how much information about the environment do you think can be extracted from the acoustic measurements in situations where 3D is important? 
Sylvia. I, I, uh, you want to look at the, it's, <laughs> it, it's nice big font too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do the inversion. The inversion. Yeah, do the inversion. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, we think that we can analyze our use, knowledge about propagation in two senses. Uh, one, if we know the cells and uh, we know the model, we, have to, we can compare the results that are expected in a particular place at a particular moment in the ocean with the experimental da data that are registered. On the other way, we, if we believed in those models, we can go on the opposite side. And sometimes, we, we, as, we hap as it happened to us, we hear something, we record something, we don't know what it is, not to, perhaps we have an idea of where it comes from, but not about the nature of the sources that generated that noise. And this is, I think, a very important uh, issue to be solved, and it can help in many uh, humanitarian situations. So uh, to study the inverse problem in order to know the nature and the characteristics of an unknown acoustic cells, I think it's important. Of course, the knowledge of the environmental uh, properties uh, are very useful to mm -hmm. do so. So from a, uh, I guess, when I saw this question, I looked at it from a climate change perspective. Okay. And so I'm wondering about any insights regarding that. The um, first thing I'll say is that there's a field of ocean acoustic tomography which has tried to invert, not tried, <laughs> which inverts for the sound speed field as a function of position using fixed sources and fixed receivers. And that's a situation where you put out, you put out a bunch of sources, you transmit um, broadband signals with complicated um, signal processing, you know exactly where the source is, your clock timing is within milli um, microseconds between the two, and so with, with microsecond resolution, full control of the, of the signal transmitted, knowledge of the location of the receivers and the sources, you can then invert for the ocean. Now we go to the CTBTO system, which doesn't have sources like that. We have a hydrophone that's drifting a little bit as on its watch circle. We don't exactly, we have really good clocks, but not for the sources. So it's a, it's a, it's a significantly different problem for how can you invert for, for things without, without what I would call a fixed, fixed situation in a controlled. So there we really hope for like repeating volcanoes to go off. Um, there's an earthquake that goes off in the same place uh, every day or every couple days, and that's a really useful um, um, source because now we have some repeatability. Um, and so if, if I were to think outside of the box of what could we estimate from, from a place where there's a repeating source, um, from the angle deflection of the back azimuth, I think you could get something to, um, related to the eddy kinetic energy. Um, as the eddies move by, they deflect the paths. And so the variability of the arrival structure could give you some estimate of, 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 of what's going on with the eddy field, um, which should have a climate signature, but it would probably be an order of magnitude smaller than, than the effect itself. We might also be able to measure where the ice extent is in Antarctica from something that went into the ice and out. Um, which is really exciting from an acoustics perspective, but I think a satellite photo will solve that in, 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 you know, in, in, in a second. So there's, there's easier ways. So if you use a, uh, an undersea volcano, does that signal basically travel the globe? It, absolutely. So we have, we have a, a problem in atmospheric infrasound is, is sources. Mm -hmm. uh, right, it's, very, it's very hard to make infrasound. Uh, volcanoes have been used to a large degree, but mm -hmm. the volcan the, in, in the rare, there's a rare case, which we'll hear about tomorrow, <laughs> where a volcanic signal traveled the globe. But usually when a vol volcano burps, uh, the signal doesn't go, mm. isn't easily detectable around the globe. So you're in a particular region. Uh, so one of the difficulties in, in using infrasound to monitor the atmosphere is the source issue. Mm. And yeah. Yeah. There's one more source that's, that's quite common, which is actually surface shipping noise. So one of the, one of the places that we might be able to use um, IMS data or hydroacoustic data um, is, is to estimate ocean health through, through just sound pressure levels. Um, there's also a, it's predicted that there would be a diurnal effect on the noise levels. As the ocean is heated and cooled and heated and cooled, um, there should be a change in the propagation of long-range um, um, sound. And so 
Um, that we haven't found that yet. We sort of expect it theoretically, but haven't found it in the data. How deep would the skin depth of that thermal perturbation be? I don't know. It's a <laughs> physical oceanography question. I, <laughs> I know there's a, there's 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 surface there, the surface duct changes daily, so that's mm -hmm. ten to ten to thirty meters. Um, Is that restricted to the uh, extreme latitudes? No, it's no. just the sun goes across okay. the the. the, the the ocean basin warms up every day and cools every day, down every day okay. as, as it rotates through. Yellow had a question. I think question from question the audience? Here. You can come up to the microphone. Yeah, yeah for, for infrasound, um, how large has to be the source if you want to have a fixed and continuous source somewhere to monitor a region? And if you can monitor a region and you have different of these sources in many places, you may probably be able to, to model the entire atmosphere from different places, but how large has to be the source and how difficult it will be to produce uh, such a signal? So it's not going to be a loudspeaker, all right? Uh, <coughs> loudspeaker would have to be the size of a couple of football fields. Mm. So usually we've used explosions that people have set off. Uh, I, I don't have a direct answer how large, but uh, People, people have recently constructed calibration sources for infrasound that you can detect a, a few kilometers away. And that's used to produce a signal that you can calibrate a, uh, a, 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 a pipe array with. Pipe array is a technical thing here. Uh, so the answer is that it would, it, it's not a, it doesn't seem to be a pragmatic uh, okay. issue. Yeah, we're thinking something like a membrane, like a flexible membrane that you can pull and just let it go. It would have to be, it would have to be enormous. Like, what's, yeah. what's a wavelength? Uh, well, if you're looking at uh, 0.5 hertz, uh, uh, the wavelength is 700 meters. OK. Thank you. <laughs> so a wind farm wouldn't do it either? A wind farm, that, yeah, good question. Yeah, they, wind farms put out uh, signals in, uh, what's, uh, someone tell me, what's the, the Primary frequency of a wind farm? Uh, One hertz, three hertz. Three, three hertz. hertz, three hertz. And they can be detected a few hundred kilometers away, I think. Uh, they're not huge sources, but uh, there's some potential. But uh, uh, the most work has been done with volcano eruptions and large explosions. Uh, the microbarom signal is something. The problem with the microbarom signal, it's radiated from the ocean surface by colliding waves. Uh, you don't really know with any precision where it's coming from, and you know with no precision when. <laughs> so it can be used as, uh, to get information about the atmosphere based on whether or not you saw a signal, but any of the precision that Kevin was alluding to is it's gone. Yeah. Well, it looks like we have five minutes remaining, so I'd like to solicit concluding remarks from each of our panelists. I just got a question. Oh, we have another question. Okay, come, come ask. Save us, Yella. <laughs> yeah. I, I have one question. <clears throat> it's about the volcanic uh, eruption that occurred last year. Um, so it led to the lamp wave that was observed global, globally, but it also yielded a lot of infrasound that was detected all over the globe. And I think a lot of the, uh, these infrasound detections are still mysterious in the sense of that we don't understand how the propagation occurred from source to receiver. Can you tell a little bit more about what model physics is still lacking in global infrasound models? Well, something that I left out, and maybe you're alluding to this, is that you can't really ignore nonlinearities in the propagation in atmospheric infrasound. That's because as you move up in the atmosphere, the density of the medium gets less and less and less, and that means that the shock formation distance gets shorter. Uh, when you get in the stratosphere and above, uh, you send up a signal, it shocks up before it comes back. And in the thermosphere, the nonlinear effects are enormous. Uh, what we were postulating at the time, I haven't kept up with advances in the past year, but my guess is it hasn't changed, is that the reason the Tonga eruption was, for example, audible in Fairbanks, Alaska, was due to nonlinear effects creating lower frequency, sorry, higher frequencies as the wave propagated. But uh, 
Uh, that requires some modeling, and, and uh, I don't know if that's been nailed yet. Uh, is there a nonlinear PE? There is a non. Well, the, the, there is a nonlinear PE that the French produced uh, that is not along the CTBT scales. It's really a tropos tropospheric model. There, uh, <coughs> these things are possible. Uh, we've for infrasound, we've been relying on weak shock theory, which means nonlinear uh, geometric acoustics. Uh, for the problem that Yell is alluding to, we would need a global model that contains nonlinearity or some cleverness uh, in the propagation. Is that what you were looking for, Yella? <laughs> okay. And, Thank and you. We're hoping that you're going to do it. It, it was mostly also because I think this particular event is, is, is an event of uh, CTBT interest. Yeah. This is a very large uh, explosion size. And um, I think we are looking for methods that we can use to explain these kinds of explosions. So. Uh, we're basically still in, in the process of making these methods available, right? And, and one of the things that it's, in principle, known how to do, uh, I mean, Alan Pierce did it years ago uh, for the, the multi-megaton blasts, is coupling between the buoyancy waves, the gravity waves, and the infrasound waves. Uh, in, in our professional lifetime, we've been focused mostly on frequencies where you don't have to include the, the buoyancy waves, but for this Tonga eruption, it's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, like, again, it's in principle, it's math and computer science to get that done, but it, it, it hasn't been uh, with some small exceptions. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sylvia, do you have any concluding remarks? Any final comments? I have no, no more remarks. No? Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay. Yep. Yeah, I, I would say it's an exciting time to be in global acoustics. Um, when we started this out, I, I hand digitized the ocean using a Russian atlas with seven sound speed layers. I flipped pages and wrote out the sound speed profile for the ocean. And so today we have high resolution, three kilometer resolution dynamic ocean models. We have computers that can do anything that you want as faster than you've ever done it before. And now we also, with the IMS, we have a, a huge trove of data. So, so there's going to be lots of advances in the next five or 10 years as we look at all of this data that's coming back. We have the capability of doing complicated propagation through complicated environments. So it's a, it's a good time to be doing this. It would be our totally. challenge, as I said. <laughs> totally agree. Okay. Well, I think we're just about out of time now. Um, so I'd like to thank our panelists and thank you, audience, for participating, attending, and thanks to everybody online who is listening. And please enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>